live from the Computer History Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's the Cube, covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2016. Brought to you by Mirantis. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Lisa Martin. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are live in Silicon Valley for the OpenStack Silicon Valley or OpenStack SV as it's called. The hashtag OpenStack SV or hashtag OSSV16. This is theCUBE Silicon Angle's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Lisa Martin. Next, this past, these past two days live action. Our next guest, CUBE Luminary and living legend, Lou Tucker, VP, CTO of Cisco, uh, been in the industry a long time, and actually is the only person here at the OpenStack Silicon Valley Commerce at the Computer History Museum that actually has a product in the museum itself. Lou, welcome back to theCUBE. Thank you, I'm afraid that dates me quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you look great, it's Better. going on 35? <laughs> yeah, something yeah. like that. 25, yeah, okay, exactly. me too. Um, we were talking yesterday, we got a great photo, I just tweeted on my timeline, at Ferrier, Lou and I, really on your product that's actually in the museum, it's mm -hmm. actually a cube shape, so cube, <laughs> very fitting. It was a supercomputer. Exactly right. We have the supercomputer of media, pumping out as much signal as we possibly yep. can. But it was a supercomputer, and it was all mm -hmm. built from scratch. Exactly right, that's the way we did it back in those days. I mean, there was very much of a, um, coming out of a lot of MIT and, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, thinking that you had to do it all and you had to know it all. So yes, we had our own processors. We had a, we had a different model though, but we were also trying to disrupt the industry much as we see it today. We were saying one direction in supercomputing was make the processor faster and faster and faster. And Cray Research did that. We said, no, take thousands of computers and put them together. So take thousands of processors and we can outrun the one getting faster and faster and faster. Massively powerful supercomputing. Now we see that with the internet. That's exactly the same paradigm that people are using now to build these massively scalable applications. They're running on hundreds or thousands of servers and that's the way they serve the public. They don't build one computer to go super fast. This is a great transition because back then, Thinking Machines, the one we were uh, talking about, you built the hardware, you built the processor, you built the mm -hmm. OS, you built the compiler, everything was built from scratch, basically in a silo. Mm -hmm. But today, the supercomputer is the cloud. That's so right. essentially, people are building things from scratch in micro elements, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And distributed think, all over the yep. place with a network, yep. Yep. get distributed computing, and you got yep. unlimited access so maybe to software. Yeah, so maybe it's all about entropy. You know, the world, the universe is getting more and more distributed. Things are really, really branching out. And the advantage of that is that you can move even faster. Because now other parts of the industry are putting in the pieces, and many, many things that we're doing today are assemblies. We're assembling microservices, we call them in many, in many corners, but also taking other services and bringing them together to, offer, to make a new product. That's so, a new paradigm, Not, don't build it all yourself. So let's talk about that because the digital transformation in the data center, certainly Cisco, the business that you work for now, uh, has got a big stake mm -hmm. in that game, but mm -hmm. the bigger picture is the architectural mindset of doing that assembly. Runtime assembly, writing software to assemble component parts, mm -hmm. microservices, rise in mm -hmm. Kubernetes, Docker success, yep. all this, and now with standardization, of open stack, open compute, all this stuff's going on. What is the mindset now? And, in your, and based on your experience, you've yep. seen a lot of waves. Yep. Yep. This yep. wave seems to be faster. What's going on here? How do companies deal with this? Yeah, I, I think, well, we are seeing, you know, Moore's Law is still driving most of this, even though we're beginning to see the end of the, the processor and speed improvements and things like that. So we're assembling now larger systems as a way to keep that innovation going. But it's almost happening, I think, at two layers. One is in the transformation, I know that uh, Martin spoke yesterday here, and I've always been a big admirer of, of his viewpoints, is this software transformation of the data center. We want, things can move much faster when they're in software, and so we're seeing that change take place, and that is true for private cloud, public cloud, and that's in the infrastructure layer where OpenStack plays. Now, developers are approaching it completely differently. They're approaching, that's why we see Docker and we see containers, that is a de serving developers. It makes it easier and faster for you to develop applications that sit on top of now the software infrastructure. So now we're seeing those two forces sort of coming together. I think it's very interesting because there is a debate, is Docker going to overtake OpenStack or is, what's the coexistence? And I think all of us in the industry are seeing this is exactly the kind of layering we want to see having taking place. So they complement each other very, very well. 
Yeah, and one of the things, that I know she's got a question, I want to just, yep. just yep. continue that thought because Martine also pointed out that the developer way is completely developer-led, not supplier-led. Exactly so, right. so, so it's a different paradigm. So you talk about Gardner, all these yep. things, how people buy and purchase and all that stuff, yep. to how they do it. But so I got to ask you, so it used to be in the old days. You would the, wait for a vendor to do something. You'd set up some infrastructure and you were constrained mm -hmm. by the infrastructure and the capability of what you had. And yep. the developers have to deal with that constraint, whether it's how much RAM is in the box or what network speeds and feeds yep. add. Now it's reversed. The yep. developers are dictating policy I, to I, the infrastructure. I you see that? Absolutely, I think that's the, almost the biggest impact of cloud computing. Once we made it so that somebody can go into a Starbucks with their laptop and they can be productive, they can develop an application, they can deploy it on a public cloud, that means all of a sudden the developer is in control. And, they, and the innovation can happen in that way, and so you can see Airbnb starting up, you know, very quickly developing an app that allows them to serve a huge, huge market, and they never bought any infrastructure. So I think the, the, the power has shifted to the developer, and now the re and those and that's that, going to disrupt industries. Absolutely, now, in a very positive way. So with that power shift, and we've talked about that on the cube before, and we were talking about it yesterday. What's your advice for businesses who are there's so much choice, there's so many options. We could do it ourselves. Uh, we could outsource. What's your advice for customers? who need to navigate the complexities with data center transformation and also the power shift. Yeah, Culture yeah. is something that's quite interesting that we talk about here. What's your advice if the developers are now really empowered, how does the CEO become empowered and align with that to enable businesses to truly transform their data centers? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a great question and it, and it probably um, varied by industry. Uh, if you look at the transformation in manufacturing to a much more robotic, you know, driven manufacturing, instead of like, how do you manage large fleets of, of people working factories, now it's fleets of robots and how do you make the capital investment for that. In, in cloud computing, I think the same thing is going to be, be true. What is interesting is now, again, power shifting towards developers and the power shifting towards delivering of applications over the internet. That's a very different model that, that any CIO has to now approach because what they're trying to do is, is really serve now, instead of the systems of record or whatever, it's the systems of engagement. I think as Jeffrey Moore has talked about, you know, that systems of engagement is really where businesses now can leapfrog each other. If they're more engaged with their customers through the internet, through an app, they're going to have an advantage. So they have to do two things. They do have to understand this. They will need developers. They will need the smart technologists in their companies knowing about what's going on in this transformation. And then they have to, be aware of a larger ecosystem. Ecosystem composing of open source software and of, and of other services that are available that they can start to use that are on the Well, the proof today. point too, to go one step further, is systems of intelligence now tease out the boom of AI that we've been seeing. Yeah. Then we're way back because that's what a connection machine was built for. The reason why <laughs> we built that machine that's downstairs was to solve AI problems. And that's because computers worked fast enough. We modeled it after a lot of like neural net kind of technologies using yeah. many, many large numbers of very weak, small processes. So AI's now come full circle and is being... You know, we were, Jeff Frick and I were talking about the, our CUBE alumni, which you're part of, mm -hmm. are so prominent. We have our own neural network. <laughs> and we <laughs> want to tap into that you neural do, network. But let's talk about your product down there, Thinking yep. Machines. It yep. was supposed to solve the AI problem. So yep. I got to ask you the, yep. kind of the historical question and kind of bring it to today. Why has AI failed up to this point? Is it because of um, linguistic ontology not scaling? Is it because of the horsepower? Is it because of the software? Is it because of the academics rigidity, dogma? I mean, I think I mean, almost, <laughs> almost all of those. <laughs> I think there's there many, many reasons. I think we were largely underpowered. Uh, so I do think even at that, even when we put 65,000 processors together, we did not have the computing power of, of a, the ganglia and a sea slug. I mean, it's really, really too primitive. Now we're beginning to see the emergence of enough power so that we can have autonomously driving vehicles, we can have Siri answering questions for us. That's a lot of computing power that we never had before. And it's still, and it's still beginning you know, to see some of the, the changes, how it gets applied, like in healthcare and everything else. So there's been several shifts in, in the history of AI. We had expert systems for a while, yeah. where we thought we could construct logical diagrams to answer questions. Now we're, and at that time there was also neural nets, but they weren't performing quite as well. Now we're seeing neural net technology is coming on very, very strong, and so you're seeing AlphaGo, for example, which yeah. got much better when you had one AlphaGo system playing against another AlphaGo system. They could learn from each other. 
from, from their And now real time, obviously the data in memory, the, 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 the mm -hmm. advances of in memory technology. Yes, exactly. But we still come back, come back down to the network as the bottleneck. So back it to is, networking, right? Is, so is. how do we solve the network bottleneck? Um, <laughs> well, we have to make sure. Martin tried that with SDN. I mean, that's true, is that that's true. Well, I, th I think there's, there's been some success there as well. I think that we're seeing that we needed to take networking from being a hardware problem that we were solving to now a software problem. And so I think what we've been seeing in software-defined networking and everything else has been that transformation. We're just at the beginning of that. And now I think that we are seeing things such as virtual network functions and, and NFE, network function virtualization, where we're seeing, again, software coming in, which can be deployed more quickly, can be updated uh, faster, and can be run at a lower cost for a lot of the service providers. But we are just at the beginning of that transformation. So I'd ask about open source. We had, I, saw, I had a talk with Lauren Cooney, who's working with you mm -hmm. and Cisco. Yep. And I want to bring a Cisco question, but I also want to bring in a Lou yep. Tucker question with that too, is open source is now a tier one citizen and try major innovation at many levels. Yes. Too many yes. to even talk about right now, but we'll have another save for that. But the old way of locking in the spec or having competitive advantage that mm -hmm. Cisco took advantage of was mm -hmm. a nestedness, an architecture of proprietary hardware and right. software to have a great backbone, and it was really hard to swap out a, a Cisco gear yep. because it would yep. take yep. down everything. Yep. It's a great yep. competitive strategy, product strategy. Now as the world moves to open source, how do you guys view, how should people look at competitive advantage, and how is Cisco um, think, changing yeah. their game to be more yeah, open source. Yeah. Yeah, so, so one thing about Cisco to understand though also, Cisco's always been built around standards. And then, so we would get together with others in the industry. It's a slower moving process than open source, yeah. but the standardization process, that's how we got TCP IP and everything yeah. else. Then we would compete on implementation. And then we would say, okay, we're going to put this in the silicon, we're going to do ASICs, we're going to make the most competitive product adhering to that standard. In open source, I think a very similar but different motion is, is at play here. That's where we are seeing that. So it's that tactically a different work. It's tactically, flow. but it still serves the same purpose, which same the customers philosophy. do not want to see completely proprietary systems. Right. Yeah. What they want is something that they can avoid vendor lock-in. OpenStack has all been about avoiding a lock-in a vendor, but now they're, then they're asking the vendor, show me that you have the best implementation. Show me you can deliver the service the best. So show me that you can move with the greatest speed. Or scale. Or scale. So those become the features, not the APIs and everything else. We're going to agree upon the APIs, we're going to agree on the platform, because that's what customers want. And so Cisco's involved in like 35 or 40 different open source projects today. And so we're seeing it across the board within Cisco's business. So along my friend, I wanted to get your take as the vice chairman of the board of mm -hmm. OpenStack Foundation. We talked a lot yesterday, we've seen a lot of, of success cases. In fact, Jonathan Bryce talked about wanting to be able to share that success. We've seen a, and heard a lot about AT&T, mm -hmm. SAP, some of the super users of OpenStack. With what Cisco is doing with OpenStack, mm -hmm. When are we going to start seeing more diversity in terms of use cases in, in retail, in manufacturing? Are we on the precipice of that? I, I think we are. I mean, I think even in, the, in our shows, we, uh, the OpenStack Summit, I mean, we try to showcase mm -hmm. different use cases that people have had been from manufacturing. We're seeing a lot in terms of you know, automobile manufacturing and IoT and those other areas and gaming. So we're, we're starting to see that spread out. As, and that reflects something that the board is tr trying to drive very directly, which is that we want to start addressing users of OpenStack, not just the developers of OpenStack. Of course, OpenStack is a open source project and it's about the developers who are developing all of the different services in OpenStack. But we want to start focusing on how does this apply to the users and get much more input from the users yeah. so that they can, they can inform the, the different project technical leads about what they need OpenStack to do for them. And that's a timing issue too, when you have incubation, you're building the foundation yep. of OpenStack, it's a developer-centric, obviously. That's right. Now that's you right. start to see this customer successes come in. Yep. And you do see some diversity, SaaS players, you mentioned some gaming. Yep. You yep. do. I think we've even seen, I think that um, um, Craig McLaughlin was showing on in Google and Kubernetes that they wake up every day and they discover there are new, new players that are using Kubernetes in an application they never even had envisioned before. That, that's that's the fun part about building a platform, is that you yeah. all of a sudden are enabling other people to do all these wonderful things. Yeah, and the Docker's a great example. That comes, no, I won't say it came yeah. out of the woodwork, but I mean, yeah. it evolved very fast. Now yep. Kubernetes is one of the fastest growing trends. Right, exactly right. What is the impact of Docker and Kubernetes to this whole 
system here? Um, I, I think it's, an, it, again, it's, it's a reflection of the fact that the developers now needed a better way for them to develop and compose applications. We've heard about microservices, of, of something which is actually a design pattern that's not that new. It really is a design pattern around making a, a composite of a set of services that are each have do a job very well, and you bring them together to create your application. That is, is ideally suited, that's where Docker and Kubernetes start mm -hmm. to allow that kind of thinking to take place so that you can construct smaller components, put them in containers, deploy them very, very rapidly, deploy them on your laptop, deploy them up in the cloud, deploy them on bare metal, deploy them on a virtual machine. It allows you to have the flexibility that you want, whereas in a container, you're putting everything you need into a container. That's why it's the con shipping container <laughs> you know, analogy. It's an envelope. It's an, it, is, <laughs> it is, and it's a packaging system, yeah. but it's ideally suited then for developers uh, to be able to share code and... Yeah. and, and Interoperability's been a key thing there. Exactly. Let's talk about the future, let's talk about the vision. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've been around, you've seen the many cycles, we've seen the computer industry yep. grow yep. from scratch. I yep. mean, you've seen the... And everyone talks about the main, the mainframes, client server, all that great stuff. But let's go forward. What's the pot? What's the possibilities? Because when you think about IoT, you're really kind of thinking about a whole new data model. Yeah. You're thinking about a whole new transit of, of packets, maybe different yeah, protocols. Yeah. I think there is a there is an there's a direction. There's an arrow that we are following here. If we, if I reflect way back in the into the mainframe era and into personal computers and client server computing, now into the internet which is that computing is becoming distributed, mm -hmm. it's becoming in multiple locations, that we're seeing an application uh, has to, the more distributed you are, the more resilient you become to any particular failure. We've seen failures most recently in the airline mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> reservation <laughs> systems, and that's largely awesome because we're, saying. Not, we're not fully distributed enough today, so that we can have cascading failures that can take out an entire sort of segment for you know, uh, a reservation system. Those need to be much, much more distributed. So we're going to rely much more on the internet. And our computing, our ultimate computing platform is the internet, or the next generation after the internet, to make it really a functional computer at, at a global scale. So if we were, you and I started consultancy, and we called it <laughs> the Tucker McKinsey uh, yeah, exactly. Consulting, we have to advise yeah. and benchmark companies. How do you look at success of a company that's competing on a global scale? What does their company look like from an architecture, from a philosophy standpoint, what, what is the benchmark of a good company and what is the benchmark yeah. of, a, of, a, of a marked for death company? I mean, you can yeah. almost like I, see I, certain I, I patterns. Think, yes, yes, I think, it, I think it's pretty clear. The companies, I mean, if you, if you look at Amazon or Google, even Microsoft shifting in that direction, they are becoming software-based companies. They are, are fully distributed in what they're serving. They're serving global markets. So they're moving very, very quickly, much more quickly than almost any their their competitors around in that space. I think that if you look at you know the Ubers, the Airbnb, the other disruptors, they're using the same model. They're using the internet to connect to their customers. They're building virtual businesses that might not have any physical, you know, a digital infrastructure to hold with it. They are becoming fully digital companies, and that I think is, is, is those are That's the companies. That's the asset test for you. Are Absolutely. they fully digital? Absolutely. And the resiliency thing around distributed means just more exactly. fault tolerance, exactly. kind of network theory kind of concepts. Yeah. Yeah. While the internet was built, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Is there a DNS for the, yeah, these yeah, companies? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Lou, great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for your insight, and congratulations on the great product you have in the, in the museum, theCUBE. Uh, I'm old enough to remember Thinking Machines <laughs> in Cambridge. A lot of my friends went to go work there, right across the river from Northeastern. Uh, great to see you again. Thanks for Perfect. taking the time to share perspective and it's always an honor. Thanks for having okay. me on theCUBE. Thank you so much. All right, you're watching theCUBE here. I'm John Furrier with Lisa Martin, live in Silicon Valley with Lou Tucker, living legend, CTO and VP at Cisco. We'll be right back with more great coverage after this short break. <laughs>